we're going to detour back to some of the things we've been talking about in the past, about how God wants to work with people. And I know it's very hard for people to believe some days, even in their most difficult trial. And so tonight, we're going to touch something that I feel should speak directly to people's dip most difficult situation. Before I open that chapter of the Bible, I understand that maybe not everybody's familiar with all the stories in the Old Testament. If you'll bear with me, I'm just going to take just a few minutes to summarize where this story picks up. You guys with me? Okay, so book of Genesis, right? Creation, Noah, and the ark. Okay, good. Then Abram. We spent almost a month talking about Abram. Abram's son is Isaac, and then Jacob. That's Israel. The nation of Israel is a man. He has 12 sons. That's one of them is Joseph. Joseph brings him into Egypt. And we have the book of Exodus. That's where I'm almost done. Exodus is Moses, the rising of Moses. Moses brings forth the man named Joshua. Okay? And Joshua brings him into the promised land. Everybody okay? What happens with Israel during the promised land days? The relationship with God does what? Good or detour? Detour, right? Kind of takes a detour. And God raises up something he calls judges. Come on, y'all can talk. Judges. Who are these judges? They're people just like us. There's nothing special about them in themselves. They're regular people. And yet God puts his spirit on them and they become special, right? Judges last for several hundred years. I don't know how many of you guys would realize that. Some people say 300 years. Some people say even 400 plus years. And it comes to a point in the book of 1 Samuel. And that's where we're going to start tonight. And I understand that Samuel may not mean something to everybody. But by the end of the night, you're going to see that it means everything to you. Is everybody okay? So as we open the book of 1 Samuel, I want you to understand the context. It's a time where the people of God were just all over the place. They were just everywhere. They didn't know what the sure ground was. They really just didn't know what direction they were going. And God wanted to raise up somebody named Samuel. Before we open to 1 Samuel, for the sake of time, I just want to summarize again. The 1 Samuel starts with a man named Elkanah. Elkanah. It's a man named Elkanah. He has two wives. One is named Penaniah and Hannah. You can imagine how long we have to read through this, so I just get through this. Hannah and Penaniah. What's the difference? Penaniah has children. She has several children. And Hannah has no kids. So this is where we start. See, because when we open up the book of 1 Samuel, I don't want you to read it casually. And as we look at it together, it's not a simple story. It's about a woman who has not received her promise. How many of you guys see that? It's about a woman who's asking God, where is the fruit of my womb? She believes God for it. And yet her own family, in a sense her sister-in-law, is doing well. And for her, she's saying, God, why are you ignoring me? I'm not talking about children now, guys. But I want you to see as we begin to open up 1 Samuel, that no one's just talking about a child. Because during this week as I prayed, when God came and told me, for this Sunday, he said this. He said, I want to talk to you. And this is a sermon. He said, about a revival named Samuel. I'll say that again. What God told me is that tonight we're going to say, talk about a revival named Samuel. So we're not talking children. See, for Hannah, this is a story few people want to understand or even experience. She is a woman who believes in God. Yes? Yes. But she's asking God for something that hasn't happened. But what she gets is far more than she ever would have believed. Do you see that? For Hannah, she begins to ask God for a child, but she gets something different. And it comes out of great grief and great trial. And when we study this story together, I want you to understand the context that Hannah is no different than you and I. See, many of us can pretend like we're doing well. But there's something in us that is pushing us and is creating a friction with God. You follow? 
maybe for some of us, we've been asking God, when is my breakthrough? Why is it my family, so to speak, in the family of God, is doing well, but I'm isolated? Where is my wedding? Where is my degree? Why are studies so hard for me? Why do people not have to listen to me? Why do they ignore me? Why am I alone? Do you see the Hannah story here? See, Hannah believes God, but it's as though God does not want to listen. But in her own family, her name is Penaniah, has children. And she feels the weight of the world upon her shoulders. And so when you open up the book of 1 Samuel, if you were to just blow by that, you're missing the whole point of Samuel. It's not just a man. It's a life-changing event. Are you with me? So in the book of 1 Samuel, it says that her husband is Elkanah. And you read that he loves her very much and gives her a double portion for their yearly sacrifice. For many of us, Elkanah represents the relationship we have with Jesus. It says that he loved her very much, but there's no fruit. She wasn't saying, God, I don't believe in you. Jesus I don't believe in you. But she's saying, if you're with me, where's the promise? Why do I see nothing? Jesus, you're looking at me. We're in a relationship together. But what's going on? I have nothing. And the other people who know you seem to have everything. It's a problem. As we pick up first Samuel, you're going to find that she goes and gets an answer where? At the tabernacle. She goes into a place, what's called at that time in the Old Covenant, the tabernacle. That's where you would have the place in which God would reside. Do you remember the Holy of Holies? So there would be a gold throne. And then you would have the showroom, the showbread. You would have the lampstand. And she wouldn't go inside, but she would pray. And a man named Eli is priest at that time. Does Eli understand what's happening to her? No. See, some of you are still in a place where you're like, God... The believers in the house of God, the leaders don't even understand my pain. As a matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, nobody felt the pain like Hannah. I've told you in the times past, I will not measure your pain to mine. Why? <coughs> Only Hannah knows how bad it hurts. Only you, you know how bad your pain hurts. Only you know how hard failure feels. And when she goes to the tabernacle, and Eli sees her praying, he accuses her of being drunk, and she says, you don't even understand me. How many of you guys have felt that way? When people see you acting out, and they look at you, and they say, look at your behavior. You say, you don't even know how I feel, do you? You just want to look at me, but you can't understand what's happening in here. So it's a hard story. This is just the first chapter. But I don't want to dwell on that too long, because I'm going to show you when God says, talk to them about a revival named Sam. All this is going to change. All this is going to change. Let's go to 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. 1 Samuel, chapter 1, 17 18. 18. See, this woman began to cry out in the spirit. And even if you want to just sidetrack to Romans 8, 26, and you don't have to go there if you don't like. Romans 8, 26 says the spirit would groan with utterings that cannot be spoken. You can put that in your notes, Romans 8, 26. But after that prayer, Eli says this, he says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you've asked to him. He says, Go in peace. And it says that, So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. I want you to draw your attention to this scripture. Eli didn't really understand what was happening to Hannah. Doesn't know how bad your weekend's been. Doesn't know how, how harshly you've been treated. All I can say is, I don't know how bad you're hurting, but I have one thing I can tell you. Go in peace. You say, why does that matter? That seems too simple for me. May I remind you, when Jesus Christ was on this earth, he died and he resurrected and he appeared to the disciples. Do you remember how he greeted them? Peace. Peace. Simple as that. Jesus would appear to the 12 disciples and he would say what? The doors were locked. He just showed up. And he would say, 
peace be with you. See, Eli said, all I know is that God will give you an answer of peace. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't understand your situation, but this much I know. God can give you peace. And it says, her sadness left. She wasn't sure what was going to happen. But she knew something had to change. My friends, I got to tell you today that God wants to speak peace in this house. Because I know that each of you are dealing with some trial, some measure of difficulty, and I cannot say that I understand your pain to as full as God does. But in me, as a man that speaks to you about God's word, I can tell you this. God wants to tell you peace is with you. And you say, what does that mean? That's what we're going to find out. So that's what I'm saying. We want to find out our answer peace. Whatever it is that's bothering you as you came here tonight, I want you to understand that God says, I want to give you peace. And you're about to find out what that looks like. Are you all ready? Are you ready for this? See, I've just pushed all this into a message. It's not easy. This takes me hours. What is peace? First of all, it said that she was no longer sad. She believed him in his word. You have to believe God at his word. Some of you aren't willing to believe God at his word. You say, well, God, I need a sign. He needed to wave some sparkly dust on me. I, I need to see something. I, I don't buy it. But for Hannah, she said, if God says peace, then I'm good. And she goes back. And what happens? She goes back to her husband named Elkanah. And they go together. And guess what? A son is born. And she named him Samuel. For those of you who want to know what she meant by Samuel, it said, the Lord has heard me. The Lord has heard me. And so I'm going to show you there's a progression of events. Because she would have trialed so hard to have this child. To see this promise fulfilled. Whatever it is that's troubling you. When you finally get that promise. is no small thing. And what does she say? She goes back. 1 Samuel 26 through 28. She goes back to the tabernacle. The place where she found her peace. And Hannah says this, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I've asked of him. Therefore I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. This is what I want to show you. When she received her promise, she could have held on to him, correct? She could have held on to him. But she struggled so hard in her trial, she was not just going to accept a simple answer. She was thinking bigger. She was thinking there's something greater in this. And she said, I'm going to leave him in God's hands. Do you understand? Some of you are saying, why is my life so different than people? And you begin to see God doing something in your life, maybe even in this house. I want to tell you, it's not over. You've just begun. See, for most people, even an ordinary believer, they said, hey, we had our first child. Amen, amen. They would sing and dance. But Hannah's different than you guys. You know why? She said, no, it's not over. I struggle too hard to get this. I'm not stopping with just an ordinary child. I'm going to put him in the hands of the Lord. And let me tell you, if you're praying for something right now, and you're saying, hey, God's beginning to move my life, don't take 10% and quit. You keep saying, God, how far does this go? I spend so much time. I've lost so much of my life to get here. I'm going to put it back in your hands. If you guys want to see a revival out of your promise that you're asking God for right now, you follow Hannah's steps. They're for each of you. You say, I'm not a woman. I'm not having a child. I'm not talking children, guys. I'm talking about a revival named Samuel. How many of you guys understand me so far? Do you understand me? You're all dealing with something. You're seeing some pain. And you're saying, God, what is it? As God begins to deliver you, your promise, you say, God, take it further. And she takes it further. She goes back to the priesthood. She says, I'm giving this to the Lord, and I want to see what happens. I want to see where this is going. I've been too different from everybody around me. I'm not going to be ordinary. I'm not just going to be a mom with a child. I want to see what happens. And so she begins to give this child to God. So we continue. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, that was 1 Samuel 1, 
In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, it says they went there to drop off the child. Then Elkanah went to his house of Ramah. It means the family went home. But the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Eli is the priest of that day. Elkanah was the husband. So what happens? For what you are asking from God to begin to transition into the supernatural, into the top level of God, you have to recognize that that promise is being given to God's hands. If you're looking for a breakthrough in your job environment, and God begins to work with you, you say, God, I see you're opening a door. I'm going to put this in your hands. I want it to be a place of what? Ministry. You see that? I'm not saying a pulpit. I want this situation that was so hard for me, I want it to be transformed into a place of ministry. How many of you guys know the verse? God makes all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose and who love Him. And so she says, wait a minute. This was too hard. What if God uses it as a platform to change lives? And this promise says it began to minister to God. It began to exchange thoughts, time, and feelings, and prayers. And it began to hear the word of the Lord. See, as a child, you can do this with anything, guys. If you have something you desire from God, put it in a place of prayer. And say, God, minister to it as it ministers to you. And guess what happens? Then in verse 18, it continues. It says, same chapter, 1 Samuel 2, verse 18. It says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Say, Michael, what does that mean? It means even in a young growth. Whatever promise you're asking from God, even in an infant stage, it begins to what? It begins to minister. See, you may be new at this if you're laying hands for healing. And you're saying, God, I want this healing to operate. And you're saying, but it's not mature. What does 1 Samuel 2.18 say? It says it is being groomed for what? It's being groomed for God. It's wearing a little robe. It's standing as though God was in that house. And it began to minister. Do you see that? You guys follow it. Don't let me lose you. Because for you to see the fullness of your promise, you can't say, well, Michael, I want to be 100%. You've got to grow. You've got to grow. Too often we see something on TV or YouTube, we go, I want to do that. Or why isn't my life like that? You've got to grow. And so the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2 begins to show us First of all, what's happening? Well, why are we struggling? What is so unique about my situation? And Hannah says, wait a minute. I am not normal. And I'm not going to accept a normal life. There's something going to be different. And she puts that problem right in the hands of God. And that problem begins to minister to God. Even as a young one. Even with a young understanding. Even in a young spirit, it begins to grow. I'll show you what happens next. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. This is the thing that many people get hung up on. 1 Samuel 2, verse 21. Many people freeze up on this. It says this. 1 Samuel 2, 21 says, And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Do you know what's happening? She kept having children. See, the most dangerous pitfall for a believer today is when they're waiting for God for one thing and they shut their life down. You know what I'm talking about? Do you know what that feels like? Let me tell you something else. What God told me about this morning, about people shutting it down. God said there are many believers miscarrying their promise and don't bring their full term. That's a hard thing to say. I'm not even wrong. That's a hard thing to say when God says, when you are birthing your promise and you miscarry. And what's even worse is when we have clinics called doctors aborting your promise saying, it's too late for your promise, brother. You missed your avenue. You've been messing around for the last five years. Your life is done. God calls those abortionists. That's a hard, that's a hard thing to say for God. For God to say, people say, well, you can't get healed. God doesn't work that way. That's an abortion clinic. I'd say get away from that person. And somebody says, well, God hates you. You wasted your life. It's because you're in sin. 
We don't need that kind of murder in this house. We are a house of life. And so when God says to you, Hannah, continue to have children, what am I saying? Keep pushing, guys. Keep pushing. She wasn't done with one promise. Samuel had not become the Samuel you know. And she said, well, it's okay. I'm going to keep having more promises with God. Someone says, Michael, where's my marriage? Where's my friends? Where's my life? I am entrapped in my own closet. And that closet is beginning to mature this womb and is growing somebody in there. Just hang and just stand there at the door. No. You take note of verse 21. You said she continued to have children. She continued to see promises come forth out of her own body. Her own womb continued to create with God. How many understand a womb is a place that God puts his spirit into? You know what it is to bear a child? That means God puts a child in you. When God puts his spirit inside of you, it can create, it can birth. Some of you are saying, God, I want to work with you on a much higher level. You must understand God sees you as a vessel that can birth something in you. And even though she says, okay, this Samuel's not done, I'm going to continue moving on with God. I plead with you again. Some of you get hung up on one problem. And you just cut the throat. You just cut your own life off. You say, I'm done. I miscarry. I'm out. God doesn't, God's not real. I don't want to work with him anymore. Hannah struggled and still said, I can have more. Go to verse 26, same chapter. Meanwhile, the Samuel says this, verse 26. And the child Samuel, this promise that you were asking God for, and the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. This child, it specifically says child, this infant promise, this new beginning for you in its young stage is doing what? It's growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. Are you guys still with me? This verse is going to sound very familiar. There is another boy just like this promise. He was spoken highly of. Many people were waiting. He was also a revival, not just to Israel, but to this world. Go to Luke 2, 52. Luke 2, verse 52. You remember, Luke chapter 2 is about a boy named Jesus. It says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. That was almost word for word, guys. Word for word. Jesus, the boy, became growing in stature and in favor with God and men. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, 26. Samuel, the boy, stature, growth, favor with God and men. Do y'all see that? See, this is Hannah's promise that is becoming great in God's eyes. To what measure? That God would reference it to his own son, Jesus. Do you think there's something small here? Do you think we're small talking about a small magnitude or scale? I disagree. I would tell you that your trial right now speaks volumes beyond what your eyes have ever seen in your life. Because when they met that boy, Jesus, they never thought he would be the glorification of God. They just saw a boy. And when they saw Hannah, they never thought that little promise could mean so much. But what is happening? This promise is growing. It's growing. It's changing every day. And people say, oh, look at your faith. It's so young. They say that about Jesus. Look at him. He's just a kid. That's not the Savior. That's not the Messiah. Get out of town. We're looking for a king. It's not you. How can you tell me your life's going to change mine? How can you tell me you have answers? Look at you. A revival named Samuel. God's not joking. A revival named Samuel. Because if you don't understand this platform that God is working through, you cannot move to chapter 3. I would caution you to not casually read your Bible like that. Before you transition from chapter 2 to 3, I want you to understand very carefully that Samuel grew and you're growing. And your promise is growing. And what you're investing your life into is growing. But there comes a day that God calls. 
1 Samuel 3 is what? Eli and Samuel are in the tabernacle. And Samuel hears a voice. Hey, Samuel. How many of you guys remember that? The very first part of 1 Samuel 3, you'll read that Samuel hears an audible voice. It says, Samuel. And Samuel does what? He thinks it's Eli. Many believers today are not ready for the calling because they don't understand. See, at some point, Hannah has been calling from God for this promise, and she says, What's the name of Samuel mean again? God has heard. God has heard me, Samuel. This promise has been growing, changing. Maturing, mighty in the spirit. And God says what? Sam, come. All these years you're ministering to me. You're asking me for something, Samuel. Hannah said you would be special. Come to me. You guys see that. And Samuel thinks what? Let me go to Eli. Hey, Eli. Hey, pastor. Michael, tell me something about this. See, Eli says, I wasn't talking to you, buddy. Samuel goes to bed. God again says, Samuel, why? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24 says this. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. Who's that? God. So what does God do? He says, Samuel. Again, Samuel. This promise, this budding revival, this change for so many lives, says, Eli, I'm here. He said, man, it's not me. It's not about people. It's not about my ministry. It's not about what I can do for you. God is choosing you. Hear me. God is choosing you. Samuel, even in his young stage, wasn't even fully aware, but Eli, being a man, said, God's got his finger on you, buddy. What you've been asking God for all these years, you're about to have an encounter with God. Do you see that? See, my job is to point you to Christ, not me. And Eli recognizes that and says, there's something different. Your mom must have prayed. Your promise must have come from a lot of anguish. Go back and see what God has for you. I will only shortchange you. Go back to God. And Eli, this time, here's two words. Samuel, Samuel. He says, what is the Lord I'm here? Why does God say Samuel twice? How many of you guys are familiar with Joseph and Pharaoh's dreams? Pharaoh dreams of what? Seven cows. Seven wheat heads. And Joseph says what? The two dreams are? One, God is confirming what he's doing. Daniel, Belshazzar sees writing on the wall. Two words, mene, mene, tekel, a parson. Daniel says what? God has numbered your kingdom and finished. Samuel, Sam, I'm looking at you. It begins. It begins. See, you have to come to a place that God wants to use you. And you have to grow, and there comes a day where God says, Samuel, Samuel, I'm calling you, and I'm finishing it. Two words I want to put to your heart. Hearing, understanding. Hearing, understanding. For many believers, they can only hear a word, but it doesn't go in here. They don't understand. And because of that, you will end up staying in that tabernacle and saying, Eli, what's the answer? Eli, what's the answer? Eli, the man of God, says, you don't understand, boy. You don't understand. You go back to God till you get it and understand. And God says, Samuel, Samuel. Hear it. Understand. You write that down. You write it down in your hearts. When God calls you twice, he's doing something mighty. And Samuel begins to change dramatically. And begin the next stage of your promise's life. I'm not speaking about a man. Remember that, guys. I'm speaking about what it is you're dealing with. 
You've been dealing with something that's beyond something you even care to admit to somebody else. But let me tell you, there's a bright light at the end of that tunnel. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3, same chapter, 19 through 21. And you're going to see the revealing of this. It says, So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Do you understand what just happened? God is on the move with this man. How many of you guys want God on the move with your promise? What are you asking God for? Do you not want God to reveal himself through that promise? Do you see that? Where does it brew from? Hannah. And now God is saying, Samuel, I'm about to finish that work I began in you. Philippians 1 6, Christ has begun a good work and you will also finish it. And so God begins to move with Samuel and says that all the people knew that God is working with this person and God is revealing himself to them and establishing every word. He said, Michael, I'm not Samuel. Read again. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 16 and 17. And tell me what you have to do with Samuel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 16 and 17 says this. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts, read very carefully, and establish you in what? Every good word and work. You write that down. God, through Christ, will establish every word and every work. Some of you guys are looking for the power of God. Let me tell you, I found it in these scriptures. You want to know what power looks like? You understand how God works with a man. And you see how God would establish you through your word. And that what you're doing, God establishes you. So you see Samuel. And you see a transition from how a guy got to this stage. And you say, look, it started at the beginning with an outcry. It began with brokenness. And God answered with a word of peace. She goes home, settled in her head that God is going to start the work. She begins to see Samuel grow, and she says, no, I don't want an ordinary child. I'm going to put it back in the hands of the Lord. And there the Lord begins to minister to Samuel. And then in 1 Samuel 3, we see the calling. He says, Samuel, he didn't hear. Many of you have been heard of that voice. I'm sure many of you have been woken up at night and heard a name. I've had that happen to me more times than I care to count. I'm not bragging. But God wakes me up. Even when you don't hear audibly, you wake up at 3 in the morning, let me tell you, God just tapped you on the shoulder. You don't have to hear. You just wake up suddenly. Let me just tell you, it's time to pray. Just like Samuel. Don't be a fool. Understand. And he begins to mature you, and he brings you to a place where it's, people can say, God is working with you. That's what we have at the beginning end of 1 Samuel 3. It's going to happen. Chapters 4, 5, and 6. What happens? Everything goes dark. There's no mentions of Samuel. What happens? Eli's kids are crooked. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen by the Philistines. The nation of Israel is literally crumbling at their knees. And they're finishing off. There's no mention of Samuel. Why? Why is this in Scripture? Why does God raise up a man or woman? Why did God raise up David to develop the life? What did he say? Is there not a reason? He tells King Saul, David says then, is there not a cause? What God is showing you in Samuel is this. There is a need out inside your life right now. Right outside these doors, there's lives falling apart right now. Right outside these doors, there's people quitting on God right now. There's people in hospital saying, there's no cure for your disease, ma'am. We're giving you 28 days. Sir, your children have just been found drunk driving. And they've just killed somebody. The world's falling apart. There's no accident in the chapter 4, 5, and 6. There's no mention of Samuel. Because God is trying to show you outside of your little world. There's a big world of problems out there. Do you see that? 
So what Hannah was asking for, she said, he will not be ordinary. He must be used greatly. And God says, okay, Hannah, look at the nation of Israel falling apart. Are you willing to take on that trial? Can you love people that far? They cry out for a Savior. We'll finish it off in 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7 starts with this. It says, the people cried out to Samuel. Why? Why did they cry out to Samuel? Because they had seen God working with him. See, some of you are saying, why am I alone with God right now? I'm going to tell you very simply, they're going to call you back. Do you know that? I don't care to confess about anybody's life what they've done with me, but I can tell you for a fact, they'll call you back. Because they know God's doing something with you. They may not want to hear it now, but when things get tight, when their daughter's in the hospital, they're calling you. They know you. They may have not mocked you before, but they're going to find you. And that's what we see in 1 Samuel 7. The nation of Israel says, please, Samuel, help us. We're being devastated by the Philistines. We have no hope. What happens? 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, the entire nation, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve Him only, and He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. I don't know how many guys just read verse 4. Did you just see what happened? It said the nation Israel just said, we'll serve God. One man turned how many? An entire nation. What's tonight's sermon called? A revival named Sam. Where did it begin? Where did it begin? A woman who is struggling saying, God, you pushed me out. You're ignoring me. And now this woman's cry looks at a man who has just faced off a nation and said, come back to God. And in verse 4 it says what? They serve the Lord. One woman's trial. A nation turned. See, you underestimate the power of your gospel. You think the gospel is just Believe on Jesus and you're saved. That's true. But I say it's just. It's not just. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. This is where we start. And then God says, looks at us and says, come on. Let's do something great for God. Don't stop there. It's so funny. The Bible has three groups of people. We have God. We have us. And we have that pesky fellow and the devil. You don't see a lot of devils talk in the story. Read the next verse, though. It says in verse 7, the same chapter. Now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together in Mizpah, meaning Samuel had addressed this crowd, the Philistines got angry. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. What's happening? See, throughout the judges, you have different nations that came into Israel and began to enslave them and put them back in bondage. The Philistines had been ruling Israel during this time. And when God used Samuel to turn their hearts away from sin and idolatry, this devilish army said, No, you don't. And these people, terrified, said, Samuel, what are we going to do? Help us. How can one man stop an entire nation of devils? How can any of you, what is your only hope to stand up against the forces of darkness? Read the next verses, 9 through 11. Same chapter, for example, chapter 7. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. What's that lamb mean? Jesus. What does God say in John chapter 1, verse 29? Just a sidetrack for a minute. 
The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sin of the world. I just want to remind you something. When Samuel takes a whole lamb and sacrifices it, he's saying, I need Jesus. I need you. It's a picture of Christ. Go back to verse 9. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as back as Beth Car. Can you imagine that? One man turned an entire nation around. Two places. Your promise has the potential to bring an entire nation of fallen believers back to consolidation with Christ. One man cries out to God and stops the entire nation of devils. You don't see that? Is your struggle so small? Does God treat your struggle lightly? What it is that you're struggling with has way more potential than you've ever measured in your life. This promise that Hannah received from God not only just caused a revival in Israel, it turned to flight the army of the aliens, according to Hebrews 11. It turned to flight the army of the aliens. Sent them running. By the way, quick charismatic story. You have to know me if you understand like that. It said the Lord thundered. What's the name for James and John? Mark chapter 3. Sons of, Sons of Thunder. You think about that another day, I'll tell you. How did it work? First, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 2, 16 through 17. It says this, or 2 Thessalonians, sorry. It says, now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us, establish you in every good word and work. Do you understand that verse now? God established Samuel as a man of God. God is establishing you as people of God. Do you see that? Your word has power. Your word has power when you pray. And this man, having called upon Jesus Christ, does something very unique. I want you to read verse 12 in 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7, verse 12 says this. After having won this great victory, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called his name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Who is he saying? Who is that rock? Jesus. Who else but Jesus? What was he saying thus far? He said, I'm drawing a line in the sand. Devil, you go no further ever again in my life. You will never torment my family. You will never torment Israel. You will never touch me with sickness or disease. You will never steal from me again. I plant Christ my rock. I call it Ebenezer. Thus far, God has helped me. Do you see that? The same is no game. This guy knows something about God. And he's so bold, he goes... How, do you, how often do rocks last, by the way? Do they expire? You guys ever seen a rock waste away? It's hard. It's hard. So you think the bull and says, look, Satan, you're not moving again. That path. You're never going past that line again. You'll never cross that line with me, my family, my children, my church, my friends, my coworkers, ever again. That's the power of Ebenezer. So when you hear the word Ebenezer, I hope you never forget again. It's a man named Satan. Who's saying a revival that had asked for? See the story? There's so much to the Bible. There's just a couple of chapters. The Bible has so many chapters. You just talk about a few. Last part. It gets better. Read this. Verses 13 and 14. Verse Samuel 7. Next verse, by the way. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come anywhere in the territory of Israel. You all see that. They did not come anymore in the territory of Israel. Did his word stand? Did it? Did his word be established by God? Say yes. Isn't that amazing? How many of you guys would like to do that for your family right now? We'll do that in the church. See, church is good. We're going to plant rocks around us. Say, all right, we need to stone Christ. We'll not let the devil ever come our life. Guess what? It gets better. My prophecy for 2016. Watch it. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel 
or what? Restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. What did I say for 2016? Amen. Amen. Do you know what just happened? Not only did Christ defend them, they said, let's go get the rest of it. John 10.10. 10. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to give us life and not abundance. These guys said, if Christ is doing this, let's get it all back. I want my wasted years. I want those finances I lost. I want my bones that belong to me. Everything that God, the devil stole, that God gave me, is mine. Let's go get it. This is where believers mess up. Jesus plants his cross as this huge banner of victory. And we're like, well, let's just stay back here. These guys are bold. i got to give these guys credit. They say, if Jesus is winning, let's go to their domain and get back what belongs to us. You see that? These guys are really different. Listen, guys. I put a lot into one message. And I pray that God would speak to you concerning what I've talked about tonight. One man who came out of so much anguish and so much trial and so much difficulty and so much pain as we began this message. You look at the end, what do you see? Victory. Recovery. Protection. Dominion. One man. Who are you in God's eyes? I ask you. Who are you in God's eyes? Who are you? Are you a promise? I say yes, sir. John 17, you'll see that Jesus prayed for all of you. He prayed for himself, he prays for disciples, and he prays for us. We're a promise from God. We're a promise. And you underestimate who you are to God. Because the way Hannah prayed for Samuel, I'm going to say this lightly, does not compete with the way Jesus bled for you. Whatever anguish, whatever pain you think you're suffering, cannot compete with that man's blood. And when that man bled and died for you, you can bet it prayed like Hannah. Hannah. And when Hannah prayed, and she said, God, give me an answer of peace. When Jesus died for us, he broke open a door that was shut. And now we have what? We have peace with God. As we close this service, I want to remind you, you have peace with God. What is the problem? You go in peace. What did Eli tell her? Go in peace. And she was no longer, she was no longer sad. Let's stand. She's no longer sad. Miss Hannah, she's awesome. She's awesome. I want to close with this prayer from Hannah. She was at her own level. Would you mind putting 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 on the screen? It's Hannah's prayer. Having seen God give her an answer of peace, she says this. So Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. She was seeing something very prophetic with guys. I'm going to say it again. She smiled at her enemies. She probably saw the Philistines and said, Your days are numbered, guys. Samuel was born. Because I rejoice at your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. What was Hannah talking about rocks for? This mom was unique. There is no rock like our God. And this Samuel puts a stone called Ebenezer and said, God has helped us this far. Today is March 20th, 2016. Some of you in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and older. God has helped you this far. What you choose to do with the rest of the life is just like those Israelites. You can stay here or you can go out those doors and take back what belongs to you.